So I'm going to talk about how at a micro level in local communities and local institutions, we can make changes to increase and create equality of opportunity. But I might want to start at a much bigger picture international level by asking a simple question. Um, let me just click into the slides here. So this works. So let's think about the chance that a child born to parents in the bottom fifth of the income distribution reaches the top fifth of the income distribution. So in the United States, we would think of this as the American dream. America aspires to be a country where any child has the chance of rising up in the income distribution relative to where they started. And so I wanna start this lecture by just asking the extent to which America and other countries around the world live up to that aspiration. And so here are some statistics on that measure, that conditional probability in the US and other countries around the world where we have comparable data. You can see that in the United States, seven and a half percent of kids who start out in the bottom fifth of the income distribution reach the top fifth. That compares with 9% in the UK, 11.7% uh, in Denmark, 13.5% in Canada, more than 15% in Sweden. So these are enormous differences in children's chances of rising up and achieving upward mobility. One way to see that is if you lived in a society where your parents played no role at all in determining your future, you would have 20% of people reaching the top 20% from each fifth of the income distribution, right? So 20% is a plausible upper bound on what this number can be in a society where parent income plays no role at all. Relative to, to that upper bound, there are enormous differences between the US and UK, which look pretty similar, are actually contrary to the kind of myth of the American dream are not places where if you grow up in a low income family, you have great chances of rising up, you know, relative to Scandinavian countries, Canada, et cetera, where at least traditionally, this is actually changing a bit over time, but traditionally those countries have offered much better prospects of upward mobility. So motivated by these kinds of comparisons across countries, comparisons over time and so forth, uh, there are many, many scholars over the decades in economics and adjacent fields like sociology and political science who've been interested in understanding the determinants of economic mobility. Why is it that in some places people have better chances of rising up than in others? What implications does that have in terms of how we might change policies to create more social mobility across generations? Uh, more in, in recent years, uh, our research team and a number of others have begun to make use of large scale longitudinal administrative data, big data to use the Silicon Valley buzzword, to try to make further progress on these age old questions. So what we're gonna do with these sorts of data is study the determinants of economic opportunity by disaggregating the data across subgroups. So rather than just comparing across countries or across time periods, as a lot of the prior research was able to do with relatively small surveys. As you'll see over the course of this lecture, we're now able to drill down in a much finer way to ask about what economic mobility looks like in one zip code versus another zip code, or Oxford versus central London, or one university versus another university. And that can be very useful because it can allow us to develop quasi-experimental methods and other techniques to understand mechanisms in a much finer way with an eye towards potentially changing policies down the road to increase economic mobility. So what I'm gonna do in this talk is present an overview of a series of papers uh, with a wide variety of co-authors who, who I'll cite the papers along the way. If you're interested, you can look at further details. But you know, folks like John Friedman, Nathan Henry, and Matt Jackson, Larry Katz, Johanna Strobel, Teresa Kukler, and many, many uh, others who've contributed to this research uh, over the years. So let me start with one straightforward form of disaggregation, which is to look at the data from a geographic perspective, starting with this map here, which shows you the geography of upward mobility uh, within the United States. So I'll first describe how we construct this map and then tell you what I think we learned from it. So what we do here is take data from anonymized tax returns covering the entire US population, uh, and we focus on a subset of 20 million children who were born in the early 1980s in the United States and using tax record data, link them back to their parents in the US in order to claim a child as a dependent and get a reduction in your tax liability. Uh, 
uh, you have to write the child's social security number on your tax return. That allows us to link essentially all children in America back to their parents and back to the specific areas in which they grew up, all right? So we take that data, divide the US into 740 different metro and rural areas. And in each of those areas, we calculate a very simple measure of upward mobility. We ask, what is the average income in adulthood measured using tax returns again at age 35 for kids who grew up in low-income families? And by low-income families, I'm going to focus specifically on families making $27,000 a year, which puts you at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution in the US. So to take one example, if you take the Boston metro area where I'm from, kids who grew up in low-income families and families making $27,000 a year in Boston, when they are 35, on average, their household income is $36,800 according to their income tax filings. So similarly, uh, we can estimate that number for various other parts of the United States, and we color the map so that red-orange colors represent areas of lower levels of upward mobility, where kids who grow up in low-income families are less likely to rise up, and blue-green colors are areas with higher levels of upward mobility. So if you start by just looking at the scale in the lower right-hand side of this chart, you can see that there's an enormous amount of variation in children's chances of rising up um, across different parts of the United States. So there are some parts of the country, like much of the center of the country, a place like Dubuque, Iowa, for example, rural Midwestern United States, where kids growing up in families making $27,000 a year, one generation later, are on average making forty-five dollars or $50,000 a year. So that's a substantial amount of upward mobility in a single generation. Yet on the other hand, you have places like Charlotte, North Carolina, and much of the Southeast in the United States, where kids growing up in families at the exact same income level are actually making the same amount as their parents, or perhaps even less than their parents were 30 years later, which is remarkable given the amount of economic growth that's occurred in the United States over the past 30 years, and in cities like Charlotte in particular, which I'll come back to a couple of times in this talk. So you can see the broad regional variation you know, for yourself uh, in this map. The center of the country looks like it has much higher levels of upward mobility. Parts of the coast do as well. Um, I think this map is of interest for two reasons. First, from a scientific point of view, it gives us a new lens to study the determinants of economic opportunity that we've never had in the past. So we can start to ask, you know, why is it that kids in Salt Lake City have much better chances of rising up than kids you know, in other parts of the country. And that can maybe teach us something about uh, the science of economic opportunity, if you will. And second, from a policy perspective, if we can figure out what those key drivers are, we can potentially replicate what's happening in some of these places where we're seeing higher levels of mobility in the red and orange colored areas, thereby improving uh, rates of upward mobility overall. So motivated by that logic, the way I'm gonna structure this talk is basically in, in the first part, walk through a series of hypotheses for what might explain the variation that you're seeing in this map. You might already have some in your mind, and I'm going to systematically test a series of explanations uh, drawing from various papers that we've written over the past uh, several years. Uh, and then in the second part of the talk, I'll talk about how we can take those research findings and actually have an impact on the ground, try to change policies and evaluate the impacts of interventions, and show you where I think the frontier of this area of research is headed. So the first explanation that comes to many people's minds and is um, often uh, what economists think of is maybe this is about differences in labor markets across areas, differences in the types of jobs that are available in a place like Silicon Valley, for example, which has been obviously booming with the tech sector over the past 30 years relative to other uh, parts of America. And so to evaluate that explanation, um, let me turn to this scatter plot here, where I'm gonna take the data on upward mobility that I just showed you on the map for the 30 largest metro areas in the US and plot that against a simple measure of job growth rates from 1990 to 2010, the period over which the kids in the sample were growing up. Okay, so what you can see here is that there's basically no relationship between these two variables. In particular, you have cities like Charlotte and Atlanta which are two of the most rapidly growing cities in America. If you look at any standard cross-sectional measure of growth in those cities, 
uh, the number of jobs, the number of high paying jobs, average incomes, just drove around those cities today versus 30 years ago, it'd be totally obvious that they are much richer today than they were 30 years ago. Yet, as you can see, when you look at the lo data longitudinally, you follow the kids who grew up in Charlotte and Atlanta over time, you can see that those kids, uh, particularly the kids who grew up in low income families there, have not benefited from that economic growth. Those cities actually rank the lowest among largest, uh, large American cities in terms of rates of upward mobility. So first you might ask, you know, arithmetically, how is that even possible? When you look at repeated cross sections of data, it looks like are improving, but if you look at longitudinally, they are not. The way I think about it is Charlotte and Atlanta are basically importing talent. Lots of people move to those cities to get high paying jobs. But apparently what we see when we follow uh, kids over time is that that doesn't mean that the people who are getting those high paying jobs were growing up in a place like Charlotte, all right? So that, I think, very simple point suggests that simply bringing more jobs to a given area is not necessarily the solution to creating economic opportunity. And I'll come in a second to parallels here in the United Kingdom and show you some data for, for the UK, but I think there are very similar themes here in thinking about differences between London versus other parts of the UK and the leveling up discussion that's happening here uh, and so forth. So one simple point, I think it's not just about jobs. What this suggests is it's something about possibly human capital development. You have to actually equip people with the skills needed to get those high paying jobs uh, in order to create more upward mobility. Okay, so that was potential explanation number one, differences in labor markets. That doesn't seem to be what it's about. So, uh, you know, that in and of itself, let me just emphasize, I think has an important policy implication that, you know, in the US, for example, there was a lot of debate about trying to get the Amazon headquarters, the second Amazon headquarters to move to a particular city. You know, that may have other benefits, but in terms of just creating more economic opportunities for kids, for people living in a given area, it's not totally obvious given a relationship like this, that that's gonna fix the, the problem. So let's come back to the big map here and consider a second potential explanation. <clears throat> for those of you familiar with the demographic structure of the United States, you might recognize that there's a potential connection to race here. So places with larger black populations, the Southeast, cities in the industrial Midwest, like Cincinnati and Cleveland and Detroit, tend to be the places in the red and orange colors on this map. Now, we all know that there's a long history of racial disparities in many countries. And so you might wonder um, how much of the differences that we're seeing in this map in terms of rates of economic mobility is about differences by race rather than differences by place. Is it simply that Black Americans have lower rates of upward mobility and that's why we're seeing uh, you know, these differences across areas? Or does place matter in and of itself? So to get at that, what we did next is took the data from the tax records, which does not contain information on race and ethnicity. You don't write that down on your tax form. And we linked that data to data from the census, which does give you information on race and ethnicity for everyone in the country. And that allows us to draw this pair of maps here, showing you now separately statistics for upward mobility uh, for black men on the left and white men on the right. So when you first look at these two maps, people sometimes react by saying, oh, it looks like you've put these maps on two different color scales, kind of a blue-green color scale on the right and a red-orange color scale on the left. But if you look at the bottom of the slide, you can see that in fact, we have not done that. The maps are on exactly the same color scale. It's just that there's such an extreme difference in rates of upward mobility between black and white men uh, that it's almost like you have two different countries. You have non-overlapping distributions, basically, in terms of kids' chances of rising up. The very best places in terms of upward mobility for Black men, a place like Boston, for example, where a Black man can go on to, to expect to earn about $25,000 a year, they have lower rates of upward mobility than the very worst places uh, do for, uh, for white men, a place like Charlotte, North Carolina. So what that shows is there's you know, no understating the importance of race in the present day in the US, and I suspect in other countries as well, uh, even conditional on class. So you're comparing a set of kids who are starting out at the exact same income level, yet they have dramatically different prospects of rising up. That's very clear in the data. Now, you'll notice that when I subset the data by race here, I also began to subset it by gender. 
looking specifically at men. And there's a reason for doing that. If you now construct the exact same pair of maps for women, you see a fundamentally different picture, which is that the spectrum of colors in the map on the left and the right are completely overlapping. More broadly, if you look at rates of economic mobility for black women and white women, uh, they look quite comparable. If you look at a black woman and white woman starting out in a family at the same income level, they have very similar economic prospects. If anything, it looks like black women have slightly higher rates of upward mobility than white women do. And so you know, what, what that shows is racial disparities exhibit a very strong interaction effect with gender. Uh, racial disparities in, in mobility seem to emerge um, specifically uh, in the context of men, which might make you think about issues related to incarceration, criminal justice, discrimination in the labor market that particularly affects men. I don't think we know exactly what it is yet, but that's clearly important in understanding the nature of these racial disparities. So I think we're going to take questions at the end, but I'm happy to take a clarifying question. Yeah. cross hashing just indicates that there are no black people in those places, basically. So there's no data there. Um, I'll come back to this. U.S. is an incredibly segregated country. There are going to be places in the maps that disappear because there are no black people in, uh, in many places. Yeah. Yeah. What year? So this is data for kids born between 1978 and 1983. And we're measuring their incomes uh, when they're in their mid thirties. So why do you need to go back to those cohorts? If you go much more recent than that, you're not yet 30, 35, right? And so you need to be old enough. So why do we wait to measure people's incomes till they're something like 30? You know, I would think the graduate students here will uh, recognize that your income when you're 23 or 25 might not be, hopefully is not representative of your income from a lifetime point of view. Um, all right, so uh, those are some basic patterns that you see nationally. You know, what have we learned so far? It looks like it's not about jobs. Race seems important. But let me emphasize even conditional on race, if you look at white women, for example, there's still an enormous amount of variation across different parts of the US white women's chances of rising up across different areas, all right? So place seems to matter, even conditional on race. So to go further uh, and try to understand better what, what's driving this variation, what we did next is zoomed in to look at the data at a much finer level of disaggregation. So why do we do that? If you look at the traditional sociology literature, for example, on the role of neighborhoods and environment in shaping intergenerational outcomes, people don't as an entire city, like all of London. It's about a particular part of a city, you know, the school you go to, the neighborhood you live in, and so on. So in order to show you that data, I'm going to toggle over to this website called the Opportunity Atlas, which, you know, anyone can freely access and download data from. And so the way this works is uh, we start out with this national view, with exactly the same statistics that I've been showing you in the slides. But this works sort of like a Google map. You can enter in any address you like. I'm going to enter in New York just because it's probably a city uh, familiar to folks here. Uh, and we're going to literally zoom in to look at the data you know, at a much finer level of disaggregation. And so I first just want to make a very simple point if we look at the data here for New York. So you, know, you recognize Central Park, for example, here in New York where no one's living, so that's gray. Uh, but if you look um, you know, more generally across now census tracts in New York City. So what we're doing here is constructing the exact same statistics that I started out with, but census tract by census tract for every neighborhood in America. So there are 70,000 census tracts in America, each of which has about 4,000 people. Because you have data on the entire US population, there's enough of a sample to construct estimates of upward mobility for every one of these places. And so what you can see when you look at these data is, you know, first, just a very simple observation. If you look at the spectrum of colors on this map, it goes from the darkest reds to the deepest blues within the New York City area. So what that's telling you is you can go two miles down the road within New York, and it's like you're going from Alabama, you know, a southern state with very low rates of upward mobility, to Iowa, one of the states with the highest levels of upward mobility, just going two miles down the road. That's true in New York. That's true in basically every city uh, in the United States. So the origins of this variation in upward mobility are not 
across state lines or across labor markets. They're actually far more granular than that. Often, it's about one side of the street versus another side of the street. Dramatically different outcomes uh, for kids growing up in families at the same income level, same race, same gender, and so forth. Okay, so the roots of these differences in economic opportunity are hyper local. Now, when you get down to this level, this is also incredibly useful because now you have an even richer structure to explore in terms of trying to understand, you know, why is it, for example, that Queens in New York has much higher rates of upward mobility than many parts of the Bronx? And why do things vary, you know, in one neighborhood that's quite nearby another neighborhood? Is it about the schools? Is it about other things? And so forth. Okay, so using that data, I'm going to come back to the uh, slides here. Um, what we do next is take uh, this sort of data and ask, uh, what can we learn about the drivers of these differences in mobility uh, across places, as I was just saying? And as a first step toward doing that, um, we, uh, we do an analysis looking at people who move across areas. But before I show you that, you know, I've been showing you a lot of data for the United States. So let me just show you how I think parallel issues arise here in the UK as well. So as we've been doing this work in the US, so our team is focused primarily on, on, on the US, but other research teams have since started to replicate this work in other countries, including in the UK. And so, you know, let me give you an illustration of that, you know, given where we are. So here's the same kind of analysis done. Uh, I have a team of researchers at IFS, Pedro Carnero and, and co-authors um, using administered data from the United Kingdom, which has some limitations relative to what's available in the US. So in particular, they don't have direct linkages between parents and kids. You basically identify kids in low-income families based on who's eligible for a free school lunch, and then use tax records to look at where those kids end up in the income distribution. But same basic idea, right? You're asking, what do your prospects look like conditional on growing up in a low-income family in different parts of the UK, all right? Lighter colors here are places with higher levels of upward mobility. Red colors are places with lower levels of upward mobility. As they discussed at great length in this paper, there's once again, tremendous amount of variation across different places and children's chances of rising up with much poorer prospects for upward mobility in the North in general, better in the Southern part of the country. Oxford, you know, in particular and the surrounding area looks like a particularly good area to grow up if you're a low income kid. Much of London looks pretty good to see that in a little bit more detail. We can zoom in to the London area, you know, where, where you have this further detail. And basically a rough summary is that the outer parts of London look like they have pretty high levels of upward mobility, but then central London looks quite bad, just about as bad as places like Manchester and, and so on. So you all know this geography much better than I do, but you know, the point is that that basic point that I was making that there's very granular variation in these statistics across areas applies just as much to the UK as it does uh, in, in the US. Okay, so what is driving this variation across places in America? You know, presumably similar factors mattering here in the UK as well. That's, I think, the, the next key question. Okay, so the way I'm gonna approach that is in a, a series of steps, starting with what I think is a fundamental distinction in social science that people have been interested in, again, for many decades, how much of the variation that you see in outcomes across environments, in this case, across geographic environments, but in other cases, you know, across schools, across colleges, across different settings, how much of that is driven by the causal effects of that environment? So in this case, the causal effect of place, a given child having potentially very different outcomes if you put that child in a different place versus just sorting different types of people living in different places. So this is something people have try tried to get at for many, many years. I think there's been debate in the literature about how important causal effects are versus selection effects. Again, with these new large-scale data, I think we're able to make some progress on these issues. So what we're going to do here is look at 5 million families that move across areas using the tax records. And we're going to exploit variation in the timing of moves between families who move between the same places controlling for parental income and demographics in order to isolate the, the causal effects of places. So let me walk you through our approach step by step uh, and then uh, tell you about you know, what I think we learned from, from this strategy.
So I'm going to start with uh, one specific case. Imagine you've got a set of kids, or think about a set of kids who move from one place to another when they're exactly five years old. So they're moving from one of these census tracts that I was showing you to another census tract when they're exactly five, all right? And we're going to put on the x-axis the difference in average outcomes for kids of the same parental income background uh, who grew up in the destination area versus the origin area uh, during their entire childhood. And we're going to call permanent residents of the destination versus the origin. So concretely, if you're on the far right side of this chart, you're moving from a red colored place to a blue green colored place. And if you're on the far left side, you're making the opposite colored move. You're moving to a place where in the observational data, we see much lower levels of economic mobility. So what we're plotting on the y-axis is just the average income rank of the kids who moved when they were five years old, when they themselves become adults. And what you can see is that there's a very strong relationship here. Kids who move when they're five years old to a place where permanent residents have better outcomes, they themselves tend to have better outcomes as adults than the kids who move to worse places. So that is consistent with the idea that where you grow up has a causal effect on your outcomes, but it's obviously not dispositive, it's not definitive, because it could well be that the types of people who move to the places that are better themselves have characteristics that are better, right? They might have more educated parents, wealthier parents, et cetera. There could be various unobservables that are driving this relationship. So to get at that, let's now replicate this analysis, which we've done at age five, where we see a slope of 0.815 in this relationship. Let's now replicate that exact same analysis, estimate that slope, not just for five-year-olds, where we see, see the slope of 0.8 that I just showed you, but do that separately for all the different ages at which we observe kids moving. Kids who move when they're two, three, four, so forth and so on. What you see here is a very clear declining pattern. The later you make that move to a better place, the less of a gain you get in terms of your own outcomes. Now to think through how this potentially identifies the causal effect of place, let me first note that if you look at kids whose parents move to a better place, even when they're, say, 28, you continue to find a positive slope here, right? Now, I should note we're measuring in this particular analysis kids' income ranks when they're 24, all right? And what we're finding is that there still appears to be a positive effect of their parents moving to a better place when they're 27. So obviously, that can't be a causal effect. That has to be a selection effect. And we're going to make one critical assumption, which is the key identifying assumption underlying our quasi-experimental design, which is that the selection effect is constant across ages. So we're going to basically assume that the extent to which better parents or kids from you know, unobservably wealthier, better families are moving to better areas, the extent to which that's true at any age, like age 25, is the same as the extent to which it's true at age 10 or age five and so forth, okay? So I'll come back in a second to talk about plausibility of that assumption, but just to walk through the logic. Suppose you make that identification assumption that the selection effect is constant across ages. Then you can basically trace out this horizontal line as saying that part of this relationship is due to selection. And the remaining difference between the points and that horizontal line reflects the causal effect of moving to a better place at, at a particular age, all right? So uh, you know, if we take that assumption of constant selection, what this is basically telling us is the earlier you move to a better area, the better your outcomes look. It looks like there's an exposure effect. The earlier you move to a place with higher levels of upward mobility, the better you do in the long run. So that is, of course, predicated on the assumption that the degree of selection, the degree to which different types of families are moving to different places, does not vary with the age of the child. Now, you might wonder, is that assumption actually true? Let's think about you know, a natural case where it might fail. Suppose the parents who are very focused on their kids are motivated to get them to the best schools and so on. They figure that out when the child is very young, and they move to a better place when their children are very young. The parents who move to better places when their children are much older, 
maybe they're less focused on their kids or less educated, et cetera. Uh, if you have that kind of dynamic selection pattern, then you could potentially get this relationship even if places have no causal effect. That would be a violation of this constant selection assumption that I just outlined, right? So what is one natural way that you might deal with that? Again, exploiting the fact that you have an enormous amount of data here, you can replicate exactly this analysis comparing siblings within the same family. So you put in family fixed effects and recreate this graph. And it turns out, as we show in the paper, you get a picture that looks basically identical to the one that I'm showing you here. That is, you can compare, you know, look at a family with, say, a three-year-old and a seven-year-old that moves to uh, a better place. And you see the three-year-old is doing better than the seven-year-old exactly in proportion to that four-year age gap. So that kind of analysis and a series of other things that we do in the paper that I won't uh, bother you with here, you know, basically convinces us that this can't be about just differences in the types of families moving to different places at different ages. You're seeing the same kinds of effects emerge even within families, which really suggests that this appears to be the causal effect of growing up in a different area rather than just you know sorting, okay? So that uh, causal effects and exposure seems really critical. So since doing this study again uh, you know, in the US, there have since been a number of replications around the world with different research designs, with different data and so forth. And I think there's basically now a consensus in this literature across fields that there's this very clear dosage pattern. The earlier you move to a better neighborhood, the better you do in the long run. So you see that in the famous moving to opportunity experimental study where some families randomly received housing vouchers to move to better areas. We've done a reevaluation of that. Eric Chin has a nice quasi-experimental uh, public housing demolition paper in the AER where he documents a similar pattern for kids who were displaced from high poverty public housing projects at younger versus older ages. My colleague, my late colleague, Alberto Alessina, has a nice paper in Econometrica replicating what we did in the US uh, in African countries, recovering exactly that same kind of pattern, so forth and so on. So this seems like a really robust finding that there are these very clear dosage effects. Uh, every extra year you spend growing up in a better neighborhood improves kids' outcomes dramatically. Okay, so having established that, that there's actually a significant causal effect of childhood environment, the next question is, you know, what is it that's different about, say, suburban London or Oxford versus Manchester in terms of producing uh, very different outcomes for kids? And so here there's now, again, a big literature that's developed using the data from the Opportunity Atlas and other sources that, that I was just showing you, where you can basically get that data uh, publicly available. Um, and look at its correlation with many different factors that people have talked about as being potentially important as a determinant of social mobility. And so, you know, each of these could be a seminar, each of these is a paper in and of itself. But just to briefly summarize, you know, people have identified factors like poverty rates, the degree of income inequality, measures of racial segregation, family structure, violence and crime, pollution, exposure, various historical factors. I'm happy to talk more about these when we get to questions if, if people are interested in specific ones. But there's a picture that's emerging that this variation is not just random. There are systematic things that are related to uh, why some places produce higher levels of upward mobility than others, some of which relate to intuitive things like the quality of schools, others of which you know may or may not be totally obvious ex ante, um, you know, things related to inequality and segregation and family structure and so forth. So as I said, you know, one could go into great detail on, on how any of these work. I'm going to focus on one particular factor that strikes me as being especially important and also happens to be, you know, the most recent paper that we've written on this subject in a pair of papers we published in Nature uh, a few months ago, which focuses on the importance of social, something that people in many fields have theorized as being quite important for a variety of outcomes, economic outcomes, health outcomes, and so forth. Concept popularized by my colleague at Harvard, Bob Putnam, in a series of books, including Bowling Alone, which some of you uh, might have heard of. So I think the idea of social capital, certainly from a theoretical point of view, has been something that people have discussed for a long time. But again, in terms of empirical measurement, understanding whether it matters, what exactly we mean by social capital,
how we might change it going forward if it matters. It's been the field has been more limited in that respect. And so again, to show you, I think how allowing us to make progress there. Let me now talk about a very different source of data that we use to measure social capital to construct this map here. So again, I'll describe how we construct this map and then talk about what I think the, the lessons are. So here, what we're doing is taking data from Facebook. We've set up collaboration with Meta, the company that operates Facebook, and got data for everyone in the United States on the Facebook platform. So in particular, we're gonna focus here on people between the ages of 25 and 44. That's kind of the sweet spot of Facebook usage, um, where you've got 72 million people on the Facebook platform in the US, covers 84% of the US population. So it's not exactly like the tax records, which cover 100%, but you're pretty close. Um, and we then take that data and construct various different measures of social capital using the friendship graph of, of Facebook. I'm going to focus on one here that's particularly relevant for this topic, which I'm going to call economic connectedness, which is a measure of the degree of cross-class interaction uh, in the Facebook data. So what we're basically asking is, if you are a low-income person, you have below median income, what fraction of your Facebook friends are above median income? And we're computing that separately for people who live in every in the United States here. We use a machine learning algorithm, which I can describe in greater detail later if people are interested, to code everyone's income. And that's how we're uh, you know, constructing these measures of income. And we validate that in various ways and so forth. OK, so red colors here are places where low-income people are less likely to have high-income friends. So there's more disconnection across class lines. And blue-green color are places with more cross-class interaction. So when you look at this map, you probably recognize immediately that it looks incredibly similar to the maps that I've been showing you of upward mobility from the tax data. It's exactly the center of the country where you have the most cross-class interaction. It's the southeast where you have the least, parts of the coast where you have more, et cetera. You can formalize that by doing a scatter plot of the rates of upward mobility versus now this measure of social capital, the degree of cross-class interaction. And here you see a very strong connection between these two variables, unlike what we saw with the job growth rates that I started out with initially. Now, one potential explanation for why you see this correlation is that there's a causal effect of social capital on upward mobility. Why might that be? It could be that if you have more connections to high income people, you're more likely to get a job referral or an internship at a firm that, that gives you better career prospects. I actually think a more important mechanism might be that who you're connected to shapes kids' aspirations and you know, uh, what, what they aim to do in terms of, say, going to college or what kind of career paths they consider based on other work we and others have done. You know, uh, children seem to be heavily influenced by the specific environment around them in terms of the jobs they're exposed to, college attendance rates, and so on. If you've never met anyone who's gone to college or whose parents have gone to college, maybe that's not even on your radar screen. So there are plenty of causal mechanisms that you can think of that would generate this relationship. But there are also confounding factors that could produce this correlation, right? So to take an example, San Francisco on the upper right there, very high income city. If you're a low income person, you tend to have a lot of high income friends in San Francisco simply because you tend to be friends with the people who are around you. And so naturally, you will tend to have more high income friends. It could be that that's what's leading to very high levels of upward mobility in San Francisco, or it, living in a very rich place. You know, there's better funding for the schools. There are other resources that are maybe improving your opportunities that have nothing to do with social connections per se. So to give you a sense of how we can start to get at that, let me turn to this plot here, which I will work through in a series of steps again. I'll start by just taking data for every zip code in America. Again, we've put this data out publicly now from Facebook, where you can look at these measures of social capital for every zip code in the US. And here we're plotting these measures of economic connectedness, the share of high income friends that low income people have in every zip code in America versus median household incomes in that zip code. Okay, so just to start, you can see that there's a clear upward sliding relationship here. That makes sense. It reflects the mechanical thing that I was talking about before. You tend to be friends with people near you. So if you live in a rich zip code, you will tend to have more high income friends. Now we come to what I see as the central point here, 
Let's now color these dots by the rates of upward mobility from the opportunity tax data that I was. Remember, blue colors are places with higher levels of upward mobility. Red colors are places with lower levels of upward mobility. What you see here, I think, is a very clear and striking pattern, which is that if you take any vertical slice of this chart, you can see that as you go from, uh, say, you know, take a set of places that have a median household incomes of $50,000, so they're all roughly equally as rich. As you go from places where the poor are not interacting with the rich to places where there is a lot of cross-class interaction, the colors change systematically from red to blue. But if you do the converse exercise and take any horizontal slice of this figure, so go from a place that's much poorer to a place that's much richer, holding fixed the level of cross-class interaction, there's no change in the colors. There's basically no impact on upward mobility. So that's basically a non-parametric depiction of a two-variable regression. It's showing you that uh, rates of upward mobility are much more strongly related to economic connectedness, even holding fixed levels of income and area. And in fact, even stronger than that, once you control for levels of economic connectedness, how rich a place is actually doesn't seem to matter that much for levels of economic mobility. So the previously identified strong relationship between poverty rates and upward mobility, which had been known in this literature using other data for several decades, seems to be largely explained in a statistical sense by the social interaction variable created using the Facebook data, okay? So that's one example of this type of analysis. Let me give you a couple other examples of famous results in this literature that are explained by this variable. Here, I'm just gonna show you the regression analysis instead of walking through that non-parametric plot. So here's another example. So in some well-known work, Miles Korak and then subsequently Alan Kruger coined what's called the Great Gatsby Curve, this idea that more unequal countries or more unequal societies tend to have less mobility across generations as well. So that's documented in this first column here, where if we use the Gini coefficient as a measure of income inequality, counties with more inequality tend to have less upward mobility. That's just replicating what was well known in the past. So now we're gonna redo that, but control for this economic connectedness measure from the Facebook data. And what you can see is that completely explains the link between economic, uh, between income inequality and upward mobility. So more unequal places tend to be places with more social disconnection across class lines, and that fully accounts for the lower levels of upward mobility in a statistical sense. Another example, another well-known result in this literature is that more racially segregated neighborhoods, say predominantly black neighborhoods in the US, tend to have lower levels of upward mobility for black people. Once again, if you control for this connectedness variable, that relationship completely disappears. And so, you know, just to situate that in the literature, my colleagues, David Cutler and Ed Glazer, have a well-known paper in the QJE in 1997, where they note in the conclusion that they found that segregation is extremely harmful for blacks, but we do not yet have an exact understanding of why this is true. They tried to do a bunch of analyses like this to explain that relationship and basically had no variable that explained. Turns out this Facebook cross-class interaction variable completely explains that in a, in a statistical sense. And so a series of analyses like this and other quasi-experimental things that we're doing in, in our group have led me to think that this idea of cross-class interaction is really fundamental for understanding how to improve economic mobility going forward. And so in that vein, what I wanna do in the remaining time in this talk is talk about how we can take the set of research findings that I've talked about here which to summarize in a nutshell, you know, several different papers from our group and many, many others, but if I were to summarize it in two lines, I think basically what we've learned is that the roots of economic opportunity are hyper-local. It's about where you're growing up in something like a one or two mile radius around your house. And what really matters is childhood environment from birth to something like early 20s, okay? And factors like social connected, quality of local schools, those are the things that seem to matter that determine rates of economic mobility. Okay, so if you have that worldview, I think you would naturally think about three different ways to increase economic mobility going forward. The first approach you might think about is to reduce segregation. So if we know that there are better opportunities a few miles down the road, well, why not help more families move to those higher opportunity areas? 
So sort of a moving to opportunity approach. That's one, one way to tackle it. Second, recognizing that that's not going to be a scalable solution. You can't move everyone. Not everyone wants to move. You also have to think about how you might be able to improve the places that are currently low opportunity and turn them into high opportunity places, making place-based investments. That's, I think, a second important dimension to think about. And then finally, recognizing that the key touch point for most kids after age 18 is not the house in which they're growing up, but rather the institution of higher education they're attending. I think there are a number of things we can also do in the higher education sphere to amplify the impacts of institutions like this on economic mobility. So let me spend a few minutes talking about research we're doing in each of these three areas and talking about in particular how it's influencing policy in the US and elsewhere um, uh, based, on, based on these findings. So let me start with the moving to opportunity approach and turn to another snapshot from the Opportunity Atlas data, this time from Seattle, where you see that familiar mix of colors that we saw in the New York City area. Just like in New York, there's some places in Seattle where kids have great chances of rising up. There are other places where their prospects of rising up are terrible. So what we've done here now is in the bright green dots, overlaid the most common census tracts where people receiving housing vouchers from the federal government currently live. As a bit of institutional context, in the United States, we spend about $45 billion per year on affordable housing programs, the largest component of which are called housing choice vouchers, which basically give families rental assistance to find housing in better neighborhoods, in, in places where they might be more likely to break the cycle of poverty. In Seattle, those housing vouchers are worth about $1,500 a month. So this is not an insignificant sum of money. You might notice a puzzling pattern in this map, which is that those green dots are concentrated in the red and orange colored parts of Seattle rather than the blue green colored parts of Seattle. So despite the fact that you're getting $1,500 a month from the government, you are still living in the low mobility parts of Seattle rather than the high mobility parts of Seattle, where we've seen from the research that I've just shown you, you know, you're unlikely to have kids breaking the cycle of poverty. So when we put out this Opportunity Atlas data, a number of housing authorities and the Housing and Urban Development Agency in the US approached us and said, you know, why are we noticing this kind of pattern? Can we figure out, you know, what's going on here? And so what led to eventually was this uh, randomized trial that we ran in Seattle over the past uh, few years called Creating Moves to Opportunity. Uh, where we basically set about from an academic perspective to test why you were seeing the pattern I showed you in the previous map. On the one hand, it could be that there are certain barriers, frictions in the search process that are preventing families from moving to high opportunity areas, even if they want to do so. So, you know, maybe you don't uh, have the time to go find the right type of housing. Landlords don't want to rent to you. Uh, there's a lack of liquidity that prevents you from moving to these places. On the other hand, it could be that you have preferences to stay in lower opportunity areas, not because you don't care about your kids, but because you know you want to stay close to your family, close to your jobs. There are many other things that might you make you not want to move to the other side of the lake in Seattle, for example. So we set up a randomized trial to basically test between those two explanations and figure out, you know, could you change where families choose to live, make this program more effective from a practical policy perspective? What did we do? Took a thousand families that came in to apply for housing vouchers through the standard process in Seattle and gave 500 of them additional assistance to basically remove some of the barriers they might face. So connected them with a counselor who think of them as basically like a broker who would help you find housing in whatever neighborhood you wanted to look in. Uh, and these folks would, you know, say, I found a listing in this neighborhood that I think could work for you. It's a high opportunity area. And I'll drive you over and advocate for you with the landlord. And if you need, you know, a couple hundred dollars to pay a security deposit or an application fee, we'll make that work and so on. So all in all, this program cost about $2,500 a family. It's not cheap. But relative to the average amount that the government's already spending on these vouchers, which is $100,000 per family, remember it's $1,500 a month for many, many years while the family is receiving the voucher, it's actually a relative increase, about a 2% incremental cost. Okay, so ran an RCT, some families got the assistance, some families didn't, follow them over time, look at where they ended up moving. And you can see that in the control group, consistent with the map that I showed you, 
only 14% of families end up moving to areas that we designate as high opportunity, basically the blue green colored places in Seattle based on the Opportunity Atlas data. Whereas with the, in the treatment, that number jumps up to 55%. So you significantly shift where families end up moving and in some sense start to desegregate at some scale uh, the, the city of Seattle with more families living in higher upward mobility places, places where they're more connected to high income families and so on. To give you a sense of potential rate of return here, as I said, you're spending about $2,500 additionally per family to achieve this outcome. We estimate putting together the various results that I showed you earlier, that the kids who by chance ended up in the treatment group and ended up moving to these high opportunity places, they're going to $1,000 more over their lifetimes than the kids in the control group. So that's a small change in a policy where we're already spending $45 billion a year where I think we can, we can have dramatically greater impacts on mobility going forward. So for the students here to show, you know, this kind of work I think is not just about publishing in journals and so on, but actually has some impact on the world. Um, so what happened since we uh, did that work in Seattle is that there was a bill passed in Congress with bipartisan support sponsored by both Republican and Democratic senators um, to authorize about $80 million of funding to replicate what we did in Seattle in nine other cities across the country. So that's currently happening um, right now. Uh, and so we'll see what that demonstration generates. But I think even more importantly, on a much larger scale, there's now another bill that's been proposed um, called the Family Stability and Opportunity Vouchers Act, again, with a Republican and Democratic co-sponsor, uh, which uh, proposes to increase spending on housing vouchers in the US by $5 billion per year, which would have a sizable impact. Uh, and in particular, just highlighting some of the provisions of this bill, you can see how even in this politically polarized time, I think evidence and scientific analysis can have a significant impact. You can see how it very closely hues to the set of research findings I, I've just shared. So they propose to have an additional 500,000 housing vouchers targeted at families with kids under age six. So that's coming from those dosage graphs that I was showing that targeting moving to a better area at the youngest ages has the biggest impacts. With access to counseling and case management services, that's coming from the Seattle evidence that this seems really crucial and helping families actually make use of these resources and then engaging new landlords in the, in the voucher program, which is enough of the evidence that that connection to the landlords uh, really seems crucial. Okay, so this, you know, on some scale, I think could have an impact on, on thousands of kids' lives uh, going forward and potentially have, make a dent, at least in, in rates of economic mobility. So that's one approach. I think it's potentially promising, but, it's obviously not completely scalable. That can't be the only solution one wants to think about because there's no way you can implement that for, for all families in the US. So let me now then, motivated by that, turn to the second approach of place-based investment. We're here, I think we're at an earlier stage in terms of figuring out exactly you know, what types of interventions can work. Start out by saying you know, at a high level, a lot of the policy discussion in the US and my understanding in the UK as well, when people focus on places that are not doing as well, often what policymakers and economists also think of are uh, things focused on adults in the labor market. How do we bring jobs to a particular place? How do we get companies to locate in a certain area? How do we give tax credits for businesses and so forth? So as I said early on, my sense is that is not in and of itself the solution. I think you have to really think about how you develop human and social capital in these places where you see low levels of economic mobility through things like early childhood interventions, changing the quality of schools, job training programs, mentoring programs, and so forth. Now, which of these things is the most effective solution? What's kind of the recipe for turning a place from low opportunity to high opportunity? I think that's a central question in this field is not one I think people have the answer to. I'm gonna illustrate, I think some of the promise of these kinds of approaches and some of the challenges that we face by focusing on one particular domain, which is these uh, recent set of sectoral job training programs that are targeted at disadvantaged youth, which seemed like at least one useful strategy uh, in the sphere. 
So again, to give you a sense of why we're focusing on this and the potential policy impact of, of this sort of work, let me give you uh, another example. Going back to Charlotte, which I mentioned earlier, you know, is one of the lowest mobility cities in America. So when we put out that data that Charlotte ranks, ranks 50th out of the 50 largest American cities in the US in terms of economic mobility, they reacted in an interesting way. So there was an article in the local newspaper about that, that you know, this is a wake up call for the city. We think we're a really rich city, but really we're not. Our kids are, are not doing well and so on. That led to a commission and a task force being formed to focus on how you could improve economic mobility in Charlotte. Many things came out of that. One thing that I'm gonna highlight here is that Bank of America, which is one of the biggest banks in the US, is headquartered in Charlotte, made a commitment to hire a thousand kids from disadvantaged neighborhoods in Charlotte itself. They basically recognized, you know, we think we're helping Charlotte, but in practice, not helping the people who are growing up in Charlotte. So let's try to do that. Now they recognize that there's a reason that they were not hiring kids from those neighborhoods in Charlotte, that they were not equipped with the skills to get the types of jobs that they were trying to fill. And so um, what they did is teamed up a group called Year Up, which is a sectoral job training provider uh, that's growing rapidly in the US. That uh, what their model is basically to provide a one-year program where people who have uh, not followed like a traditional college path, you know, in their early 20s, for example, from disadvantaged communities, they take those folks training, which includes technical training in some field, like information technology or something like that, but then also provides additional, what I'd basically characterize as social support. So mentoring, connections to a set of firms that might want to hire you for exactly that set of skills and so forth. So here again, there's been a randomized trial conducted looking at people who participated in the Year Up program versus people who did not. And we've taken that data and linked it to data from tax returns to be able to follow these folks over time. And what you can see here is that in this RCT, people who participated in the Year Up program, while they're in the program, their earnings are lower. And then afterward, you can see that there's a sustained over many, many years, this actually goes out to a decade uh, now, about a 35% increase in earnings from participating in this program for a year. So our sense is targeting this kind of program to these disadvantaged neighborhoods is one you know, potential tool that could really have a significant impact on economic opportunity going forward. It's by any means the only thing one should be doing, but it's one example of how figuring out which of these things work and targeting them appropriately with the sort of data, I think can be valuable. So in the last couple of minutes here, let me just touch upon this final domain, especially given the, the setting we're in, I think very relevant about the potential impacts of higher education. Much as our team has put out data on differences in economic mobility for every neighborhood in America, we've also done that for every college in the United States. And so let me show that data to you here in the form of this scatter plot. So what we do here is take other records, administrative records, which allow us to uh, figure out where everybody in America goes to college and then link that to information from the tax returns on kids' incomes and parental incomes. And so when we think about colleges, there are really two dimensions that matter for a college's contribution to economic mobility. One is what we're calling the upward mobility rate. Among the set of low-income students, say students from the bottom 20%, what fraction reach the top 20%? And so if you, for example, you know my own institution, Harvard or Princeton, Stanford, et cetera, those kinds of places look terrific on that dimension. Kids from low-income families who attend Harvard, the vast majority of them reach the top of the income distribution well beyond. However, that's not the only thing that matters for Harvard's contribution to economic mobility. What also matters is how many low-income kids there actually are at Harvard to begin with. And so if you look on the x-axis here, that shows you the fraction of kids who come from families in the bottom 20% of the income distribution. And you can see on that dimension, these colleges really don't look great. Only 3% of kids at Harvard come from families in the bottom 20% of the income distribution. Another way to look at this is you're about 80 times more likely to attend Harvard if you come from a family in the top 1%, that is a family making more than about $700,000 a year, than uh, families in the bottom 20% of the income distribution. So when you have that kind of super skewed income distribution, obviously Harvard cannot be contributing a whole lot to economic mobility.
So that's one set of colleges that you've probably heard of in the upper left here. Then you've got, you know, every college is represented by a different dot here on this plot. Then you've got this long tail of colleges that do serve lots of income kids, but their outcomes don't look so great. The kids who go to those colleges don't have great chances of reaching the middle class or, or beyond. And so if you look at the picture of economic mobility across colleges in America, essentially, you know, the, the issue you have, one way to conceptualize it is you basically have no dots in the upper right side of this figure, which is where you need to be in order to be contributing a whole lot to economic mobility. Um, that is not a phenomenon that's unique to the US. Once again, people are starting to replicate this work in other countries. So here's an example here in the UK um, done by, I think your former colleague here, Neil Shepard, who's now at uh, my colleague at Harvard, um, doing the same kind of plot in the United Kingdom. Now the data is a little bit different because you, they're using, they're not able to directly measure parental income. They're using information on borrowing. And so lower income households here in the bottom 80% as opposed to the bottom 20%. Even with that very generous threshold of low income, right? You can see kind of a similar pattern. So Oxford and Cambridge look very much like Harvard. Great outcomes, you know, very few low income kids. Cannot be the case that Oxford's contributing a whole lot to economic mobility, just like Harvard. Um, you've, you've got that same kind of downward sloping pattern. I think it's interesting in the UK, you do have some exceptions in the upper right, like LSC and Imperial and uh, so on. And I think understanding what's happening there would be interesting, but broadly, I think you have the same uh, kind of phenomenon. So when you look at these kinds of data, and this brings us to basically, you know, what people are doing at the frontier of the sort of work, one perspective you might have is, yes, maybe there's something these kinds of colleges can do to diversify their student body. Maybe Oxford could have a more diverse student body, admit more low-income kids, for example. But another perspective you might have is, given everything else I've shown you, maybe it's not possible to maintain the high standards of selectivity of Oxford uh, while admitting more low-income students, because by JT into college, already experienced so many other disparities like we've talked about that you don't, you know, there, there's limited scope to actually diversify the student body at this stage. So that's the type of thing we're investigating now. And let me just show you one chart that I think gets at that in the U.S. context. So what we've done most recently is LinkedIn data on everyone's SAT for everyone in the United States to the tax data and the college attendance data. So the SAT is a standardized test that students take before applying to college and do a simple measure of uh, pre-college qualifications, okay? So it's a way of kind of assessing where do you stand at the point of college application. And what we're plotting here is your probability of attending an Ivy League college, Harvard, uh, you know, similar colleges, Stanford, et cetera, versus parent income for a set of kids, all of whom have exactly the same SAT score, who have an SAT score of 1500. So what you see here, I think is an interesting pattern, which is on the far right of this chart, if you happen to be from a very rich family with an SAT score exactly the same as everyone else, you are about, you know, you're quite a bit more likely to be attending these colleges than if you're from the middle class or the lower end of the income distribution. So this suggests to me that it's not entirely out of college's hands to diversify their student bodies. In particular, you could maintain exactly the same level of SAT scores and potentially have a much more diverse student body than you currently do. And so that you know, similarly would suggest to me that here at places like Oxford, there is a role for institutions like this to, to do things that might increase economic mobility. And we'll have a paper out this summer that uh, we'll have uh, more to say about that. So let me uh, conclude, showing you a bunch of different papers and, and statistics. Let me just highlight what I see as some of the central points and then uh, wrap up. So first, I think what we've learned uh, from various people's work in, in recent years is that local childhood environment really plays a central role in shaping prospects of up, for upward mobility. Second, I think while in economics, we focus a lot on financial resources and think about things like cash grants or an income tax credit programs like that, my sense is that thinking more about social capital, um, you know, coupling resources with social support, which we're seeing is effective in a number of different contexts, 
in the moving to opportunity context that I showed you, in the job training context, these new job training programs that combine training with social support rather than just providing technical skills, they're far more effective. Those kinds of things have much larger impacts on mobility out of poverty. Finally, as I've been showing you here, I think large-scale observational data can be very valuable in drilling down and understanding what kinds of interventions you need in different places rather than looking at things at a more aggregate level. Now, I think there's a lot more to be done. Let me just throw out a few ideas for students who, who might be interested. You know, I think digging more into the mechanisms that are leading to these differences in mobility, particularly looking at changes over time, which is some work we're starting to do, I think uh, would be very valuable. I think there's also a lot more to be done on the theoretical side in light of this sort of evidence. So everything that I've shown you today has the limitation of being completely partial equilibrium. You know, when you think about scaling up a policy where lots of people are moving to a different place or you're revitalizing a particular neighborhood, you wonder what's going to happen in general equilibrium where people resort. How is that going to affect outcomes? And so we're thinking about equilibrium models of intergenerational dynamics with these kinds of social interactions and some work with Matt Jackson. And then on the normative side, you know, my uh, field is public finance, thinking about optimal tax policy and questions like that. Traditionally in our field, we, we focus on the objective of uh, equality of outcomes, or it's an outcome-based. People care about equality of opportunity, independent of equality of outcomes. And I think thinking about that from a normative perspective, going beyond the Merlesian framework would be very valuable. One final direction, you know, looking around the audience, there are lots of students who are not from the US or the UK here. Let me just point out that I think these same questions arise around the world. We're starting to see people um, doing similar work in Sweden and Spain and Africa and India, where you see similar patterns in some ways, but very interesting differences in other dimensions. Uh, and I think there's a lot to be learned from that. So I, th I hope that will be of interest to, to some of you. So let me stop there. Uh, happy to take questions and thanks so much. Thanks very much. That was impressive. So we will take your chart with the UK University to the diversity community here in Oxford about uh, uh, widening participation. So let's open to the floor. Questions? Just raise your hand. Yes? Yeah. Yeah? Oh, okay. okay. Uh, hi, Raj. Uh, I'm Johan. I'm an at African College. Actually, I'm a student at Port uh, I'm visiting here. So thank you. You mentioned three uh, universities, specifically it's like a college in Cornell. <laughs> Uh, uh, do you have uh, further information regarding this? Uh, because you mentioned about uh, network, like uh, each person, if I get connected to some other person, I can also connect to other person. I just remember the, the, the concept of uh, the network centrality uh, related to that. Uh, do you happen to have a plan on that study? Yeah, yeah. Like with Patrick Jackson or? So in this work we did with Matt Jackson and others, these papers in Nature that I was mentioning, where I focused on one measure of social capital, the connectedness measure. We also constructed other measures of social capital, including central measures of how clustered a network is. So I'll give you an example, like a classic uh, measure of network structure is whether there are a lot of triangles in the network. So if you and I are both friends with uh, someone else, if, if I have two friends, are they in turn friends with each other? So it's a measure of how tight-knit a community is, if there are lots of mutual friendships like that. And so we construct those measures as well for every county in the US. We actually release 10 different measures of social capital like this. The reason I focused on the economic connectedness measure here is that is the one and only measure of social capital that's related to upward mobility. It turns out all of the other measures are completely unrelated uh, at a national level to these measures. But all of that data is also publicly available. And you know, for other types of questions, they could be quite important. And so we're hoping researchers will investigate that going forward. Thank you.
to um, local ships. Yeah. Yep. 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 So I think a key uh, thing to, to recognize in the context of understanding the impacts on local kids. So when you have a lower income kid move into what is typically a higher income neighborhood, is there potentially a negative impact on the kid? It's going to be key for understanding general equilibrium effects. So our sense from in the observational data is that there's a fundamental asymmetry in the sense that more integrated places where there's more cr cross-class interaction tend to have higher levels of upward mobility for low-income kids, but do not for kids from higher-income families. So it does not seem to be a zero-sum game. And so, you know, why exactly that is, I don't, I don't exactly know, but it's not that the like a linear in means, what we'd call it in the peer effects literature, or like a symmetric model like that. Uh, and so I think that's encouraging because it suggests that you can have these kinds of policies without, you know, someone having to bear a cost. Now, you know, conveying that to the public, there's a lot of concern among parents about centralized approach we're taking. It actually works pretty well. What does not work so well is coming and building like a public housing project that's very salient in one particular place. But my instinct is this kind of decentralized approach, both in practice, doesn't have those negative effects and appears to generate public support. Yeah. 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 Yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure I would think of that as a confound rather than as an explanatory variable. Like maybe some of these differences in institutions relate to generate these differences in outcomes across places, right? And so when you look across countries, I think a lot of the factors that I've been emphasizing, differences in the quality of education, differences in social connections, Sweden, there's now an effort with the Facebook data to replicate what we did in the US and many countries around the world, including in the UK. The UK looks a lot like the US in terms of being very disconnected across class lines. And you see similar patterns. Our senses in Scandinavian countries, you'll see less of that. You also have much more uniform funding for schools. There's a sense that schools are less disparate across areas than they are in the US. Um, and so I actually think some of those international differences can be explained by the same set of factors. Now, at a deeper level, like why have things evolved differently? It could be about differences in the, the structure of institutions at some very general level. I also think it's about differences in their scale and demographic structure. So as we know from the work of Alberto Alessina and others, uh, diverse societies, more, uh, uh, you know, um, societies with people from lots of different backgrounds, they tend to be more fragmented, right? And they tend to have less investment in public goods and so on. And so the US and the UK, to some extent, you know, that could explain why you see these patterns in these countries rather than Sweden, which at least traditionally was much more homogeneous than these other countries. We have a question from the Zoom chat. From uh, Nurudur, would you like to ask your question yourself? Can you hear me? I'll ask the question instead. Okay. Yes. So, how do we quantify effects of not my backyard policies that resist going from housing to other neighborhoods? Yeah. So, it's exactly what I was referring to earlier the not in my backyard policies that people, even if it's a fact that we seem to know now that kids from higher income families won't be hurt by this kind of inter integration. That doesn't mean people are going to necessarily support that or aware of that. And so my instinct is the flip side of what I've been showing you here, that there are benefits to this type of interaction and integration also means that those kinds of policies that resist, you know, through zoning laws or other things, preventing the sort of interaction have a significant economic cost. Um, and I think that's quite a large cost given the types of magnitudes uh, that I was showing you. So I think the question really is how do you overcome that going forward. Um, 
you know, I think very valuable area to study. So basically, the French network could say something about the social capital, but it could also say something about my social skills. So it could be like very yeah. extrovert and have the capital. Yeah. The relationship is So then the, the, the question is whether it is a return to the social capital yep. or the skills. Yeah, 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 great. Yeah, absolutely right. So let me say a couple more things about what we're exactly doing there. So importantly, we're not using individual level variation in who has more high income versus low income friends, right? So that analysis that I was showing you is done at the area level. So we're saying in places, if you, what we show in the paper is if you spend more years growing up in a place where people on average tend to interact more across class lines, you tend to be more likely to rise up. So it's not saying that you per se yourself are more likely to make more high versus low income friends. If you move at an earlier age, like that kind of dosage graph that I was showing you, earlier play, age to a place with more cross-class interaction, you do better in the long run. So it's not driven by individual level variation. That said, you, know, you might still wonder, are there other things that are correlated with having low versus high social capital that lead to higher levels of upward mobility as opposed to the connections themselves? And our senses from other forms of quasi experimental variation that we're working on now. So, you have it's, and we can use that comparison as an experimental source of variation. And we, see if you're in the cohort with more high income kids, you have better outcomes in the long run. You're more likely to go to college and so on especially if you're friends with them and so forth. So for various reasons, I think it is actually the causal chain is running from the friendship networks to outcomes uh, as opposed to the, the other way around. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I was wondering about the um, in the move to opportunities, um, do you see a negative effect on those kind of left behind? Uh, yeah. 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 So people often worry about that as well. So, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say two things on that. So, one, um, if you think about the way the moving to opportunity experiment that we did in Seattle was structured, it's not that we were taking a set of people who didn't want to move and help them move to a different place. Rather, this is a set of people who are going to move anyway. Low income households tend to move a lot face financial difficulty, some of them get evicted, you know, various things happen. Uh, even in the control group, 95% of families ended up moving. The way I think about what we're doing is redirecting the flows. So you're thinking about moving anyway, we're going to give you some assistance to potentially move to a better place, equip you with the resources needed to make that choice. Given that you were going to move anyway, it's unlikely that we're further destabilizing whatever neighborhood you lived in before, right? Because you were going to leave regardless. Now, that being said, I think your question highlights that you still absolutely want to think about how you transform the places that people are choosing to live. Because at the end of the day, I think that's the thing that you know really has scalable potential. I think the fact is at the moment, from a scientific point of view, we don't really know how to do that effectively. And so I think you know more work is needed on that front. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Neil, a fellow Bostonian. Nice. Wondering why the uh, center of the U.S. seemed to have higher is that a result of or so? Actually, in this, I skipped this, but we have these two papers using the Facebook data, and the second paper focuses on that question of the determinants of economic connectedness and why it's higher in some places than others. And so, to briefly summarize, uh, what we find is there are two different dimensions that matter intuitively. Um, actually, I think I might have a picture that illustrates this. Let me see if we're still, are we still in this? Yes, th this is what I was going to talk about. So, you know, think about two types of determinants of economic connectedness. So there's one thing that we're calling exposure. So imagine you've got two different schools. All the rich kids shown by green circles go to one school. All the poor kids go to a different school. Obviously, in that setting, you're going to have a lot of social disconnection. You can't be friends with people you never meet. 
So that's one potential issue of what you were kind of intuiting, you know, maybe it's about the level of segregation. But there's another possibility, which is you could have this kind of situation, what we're calling friending bias. You could have perfectly integrated schools, but you could still have the high income kids friends with each other and the low income kids all being friends with each other. And it turns out we're with Facebook data, not only look at who's friends with whom, but map back to where the friendships originated. We can figure out basically where you and I became friends for the various friendships and the data. And using that, you can construct measures of friending bias and exposure for every neighborhood, for every school and so forth. And so um, what we're able to show with that is that, you know, that's like this kind of measure, you know, there are lots of schools in America that appear to be very integrated, but when you dig into them using the Facebook data, you can see that actually like the Berkeley Public High School near the University of California, Berkeley is a place where the rich kids and poor kids are basically not friends with each other, even though on the surface, it seems very diverse. So the friending bias dimension is as important, it turns out, as the exposure dimension. And now coming to the answer to your question, you know, in the Midwest, not only do you have less segregation, that's part of it, but you have a lot less friending bias. So people are interacting more across class lines. Why is that happening? I think it's partly the structure of institutions. So one thing we find is people are much more likely to interact across class lines in religious institutions, for example, than in other types of settings. You take the same person, look at the friends they have that originated in institutions or in recreational groups versus in their college or in their school. It's much more stratified by class in the latter than the former. Um, but also other things matter, like just the size of communities. So as an example, you know, my wife grew up in a rural town in, in, in the Midwest. Her dad was the town doctor. There was only a single school. Everybody went to that school. It was a small school. She had a very diverse group of friends. You know, same situation. You're growing up saying being incredibly stratified. And I think there are a number of features like that of the rural Midwest. And you actually see similar patterns in the UK as well, uh, where uh, some of my students are now replicating what we did in the US and the UK, see patterns that look very much like that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so that was like a year's worth of work figuring out how to do that correctly. But um, so I'm happy you asked. Uh, um, so what, what we do basically is use a bunch of different information that Facebook has, starting from fine geocoded information, right? So given the amount of segregation that we have in most cities, if I know, uh, you know where, where you live, right? that's already gonna give me a pretty good predictor of income to begin with, right? And so we can get that information from people's mobile phone data for lots of folks. Uh, so that's a starting point. But then there are many other pieces of information that ex ante you might not have thought of, but ex post, you know, it's kind of obvious, can be quite useful in predicting your income. So, you know, th think about the model of the phone that you're using to access Facebook. If you have the latest model, it's correlated with having a high level of income. It's not a perfect predictor. I used to have, until recently, the iPhone 6. So, you know, it's not one for one uh, the related to income, but like that, you know, that's another thing that's correlated with income. Uh, many people self-report the college that they attended. We use our tax record college data to construct a predictor of their income from that. So like that, we combine 23 different things, construct a machine learning model. Your question, you correctly asked, how do we Right. So what we then do is because we're working with all these other large uh, scale data sources, we can cross validate the measures we've constructed in the Facebook data, say zip code by zip code, college by college and so forth. So take, for instance, that chart that I showed you at the end um, across colleges, rates of mobility. Can you reproduce that correctly in the Facebook data just using our uh, imputed income measures? Turns out you can do extremely well, like correlation of 0.9. And so, you know, we're spending a lot of time to, to get that right. And because you have enough variables, you can basically make it work. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Ava. I'm a postgraduate in economics for development here. I actually have two questions, but I'll make them quick. <laughs> I promise very much. 
Um, well, I was thinking about the measures, um, well, basically the income from the graphs I saw. And I was thinking, it seems to me, it seems to me that we always talk in absolute terms. Yeah. But I was thinking, is there a way to incorporate somewhat a relative measure? Hmm. Is this different for someone like me earning 25K a year, being someone who has 40K, might be different than the difference between 40K, 75K. Like, is mm-hmm. there a way? The other one I was thinking about the graph you showed about the US and how we're talking about okay, or, or UK, like what can Oxford do or what can the students do or if you expose young children. But I was thinking is the difference compensating up even further down the line? For example, in the US with employers, it's more that it's like it's maybe it's more about what the employers see where the people go to rather than the education itself. Yeah. In the sense that it's even though people might be, yeah. I don't think the standard of education is exactly the same, but content wise, maybe relatively may overlap, yeah. but it's more about the other side. What can we do to maybe better inform where people would go afterwards and mm-hmm. have companies look further than just the IDs? When mm-hmm. Yeah, those are both good questions. Um, let me take the second one first. So you're right. So like in our current work, we're trying to understand what is the causal effect of attending an Ivy League institution? Why are you seeing such good out- outcomes there? Is it because being admitted makes a difference? And if so, why? And is it about recruitment practices of firms and so on? You know, I think it's tricky to just tell, like firms are trying to optimize, right? And so arguably, I mean, it's possible that they're not optimizing. And so they're undersampling from other institutions where they could hire great people. It's certainly possible. Um, My instinct, though, is that at least part of what's going on is that these institutions are really serving as an important screening um, mechanism that make it easier for firms to identify talent. And then they, you know, do generate some value added that puts you on on a different trajectory. And so while... I think that's certainly something worth investigating further. Like in the same way that I've highlighted all these different institutions, you know, neighborhoods, schools, colleges, and so on, you can bring to the picture. One intervenes there given private market forces to behave in a very particular way in a competitive equilibrium, which is different from, you know, colleges are in principle, nonprofit, et cetera. It's a, it's a, I think a different set of issues, but would be worth investigating. Um, and then on the question of relative scale, yeah, I mean, you're quite right that I think going from a very low income to 45,000 or connecting with somebody in the middle class, particularly low, can be especially important. In a nutshell, the way I would summarize what we found is that things look linear and kind of converge at the top. So what I mean by that, and hopefully this picture will, will capture it's up clearly, now, I gave you the example of Charlotte having much lower rates of upward mobility than, say, San Francisco. So it turns out if you're a low-income kid, like at the very bottom of the dist- distribution, there's an enormous difference if you grew up in one place versus, versus the other. Same thing true in the UK, like Manchester versus the good parts of London. If you're from a very high-income family, it's basically irrelevant where you live. There's a convergence at the top. And so what you see is that circumstances matter more and more the lower income you are. And then as you get to the middle class, it's like half as important. When you get to the very top, it's completely unimportant, maybe because you're able to insulate yourself from local conditions and so forth. And so that's why we tend to focus on the bottom end of the of the distribution, but your intuition's right that it kind of converges as you as you get the truth.